You're currently listening to Never Back Down by Billy Garcia's band, The Forsaken. You can find all of Billy Garcia's music listed in the links below. Enjoy. Hey everybody, it's me, Colin Connors, host of the Survival Org Podcast. We've got a very special guest today from Survivor Cook Island, Mr. Billy Garcia. Hey Billy. How you doing, Colin? I'm doing great. How are you? I'm wonderful, thanks. Alright. So what's going on in your life right now? Uh, my band is, uh, taking off pretty good. We're going to start booking gigs, uh, starting, uh, with a few dates in November, uh, and December, and then we're going to hit the ground running come the new year. Uh, my movie, the infernal room is out. So all you people that are into, uh, uh, crazy horror movies that's out there. And, uh, you know, I'm back in the pro wrestling thing as well. So, uh, just stay tuned on my Facebook and, uh, catch the dates of when I'll be, Body slamming my next victim. Oh, I didn't even know you did pro wrestling or about the movie. What's the movie? Uh, what role do you play in the movie? Uh, I'm both an actor, an actor and a director in the movie, and I co-wrote it. And uh, it's me, Paul Grassi from The Mole, and Jason Prager from Beauty and the Geek, pretty much playing ourselves in a horror movie. Ooh, that sounds really exciting. Any any uh, any teaser you want to give us? Any kind uh, of tips about the movie? Sure, sure. Uh, the three of us uh, go on a triple date, and uh, I decide that I wanted to uh, to propose to, to my date in a more quiet setting than the party that we were heading to. So uh, we take a little detour, and uh, next thing you know, we find ourselves in a situation where we think that there is uh, some poor kidnapped victim trapped behind a door, um, and the owner of the place is insisting that She's not a kidnap victim, that she's the devil and, he, and that he's captured her. And, of course, we don't believe her. We think he's a sick SOB. And uh, we let the devil out and the horror starts. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds really interesting. I know I'll be Netflixing it. Oh, thanks. Thanks. Right. <laughs> so in wrestling, how long have you been wrestling for? Uh, I've actually been wrestling since uh, – pro wrestling since 1998. Um I used to go under the name The Spanish Fly, uh, and now that I've done Survivor, now I just go under my own name. Uh, but yeah, I've, I've wrestled uh, in matches with a lot of legends like uh, Scotty Riggs and uh, and the Honky Tonk Man, as well as wrestled other Survivors like Johnny Fairplay and Mookie Lee from Survivor Fiji. Well, yeah, I was about to ask about that. Who won, you or Johnny? Uh, it was a tag match. My tag partner got pinned. I got upset that my tag partner got pinned, so Johnny and I shaved his head. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great uh, solution to that. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, a survivor stick together. <laughs> yeah. What about with Mookie? How did that go? I practically killed the poor, poor guy. <laughs> <laughs> he, he swore after that match he was never going to do another wrestling match ever again. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're one for one against survivors. That's pretty good. Thanks, thanks. Uh, uh, well, I killed Mookie so bad, I think it should count twice. <laughs> okay, <sure. laughs> awesome, awesome. Um, let, how did you first find out about Survivor? Oh, wow. Uh, well, I was a fan already, uh, and my sister heard uh, on the radio this, uh, this advertisement for an open casting call. And uh, I dared her to do it, and uh, she chickened out, and so she dared me to do it. And uh, it didn't take much egging on for me to go try. So I showed up. There was about 5,000 people there, or at least they cut the line at 5,000 and turned everybody else away. And out of that group, I was the only one that made it. Oh, wow. Were you surprised to get on? Uh, you know, once uh, – well, the – I actually uh, cheated. I got, I did my my tryout and I blew it. And uh, I met Judd and and uh, Brian Corrigan because uh, their season had just aired, and uh, they kind of snuck me back in line. And I took a second shot at it. And uh, Erica Shea, who was the uh, who was doing the casting at that the open casting call, uh, pretty much told me that it was my spot to lose from then on. 
oh wow did you um have any idea what season you would be on or was it just you got they told you you got cast and then you were immediately sent off uh well it was a series of things they didn't tell me what what season or what was the season going to be about um i went to the la final 50 and i again it was pretty much my spot to lose once i was there and uh at that point the uh exile island had just finished airing and so i knew it was going to be the next season was going to be in the cook islands but uh it wasn't until the night before the game started that they told us that they were going to divide us up by race how did you feel about that uh, they separated us one. Uh, they took each of us one by one over to Mark Burnett and Jeff Probst and told us in private so that our reactions wouldn't work against us. And it was a good thing for me, I guess, because my reaction was, you know, it's great for Survivor. You guys are going to get a lot of ratings. It sucks for me because now I have no shot in hell of winning. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm like the most le- least looking Hispanic in the history of the Hispanic race. So. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I mean, like I'm looking at JP. JP didn't look that Hispanic. Oh, JP. JP went out of his way. JP told us the story of how he got his name, JP. Uh, He was born Juan Pablo, and he thought that was so stereotypical Hispanic that he couldn't stand it. So he changed his name to John Paul, but people would hear his last name Calderon, and they'd be like, oh, you scumbag. You disowned your race. So he got tired of being called scumbag, so he changed it again to JP. Oh, wow. yeah, he's more into the the uh, the gay culture than the Hispanic culture, but uh, he totally played up the Hispanic culture while he was out there. Okay, well, I was about to say it's kind of funny. He was hiding, he was like getting away of his Spanish culture, but that's what got him on Survivor was they needed a lot of Spanish people. Yes, yes, that's very true. Um, what they liked about me was pretty much what they liked about Flicka and uh, and Cowboy, and that's that we were the antithesis of the stereotype to our race. They they made sure there was one person in each tribe that was the exact opposite of what you would expect. Yeah, now that you mention it, I can totally see that, and I didn't think of that until you just said it. Yeah, I mean, it's great. It's a great concept on paper, mm-hmm. but when you put us out there, it's like we're we're starting the the game like with our backs to the wall. <laughs> we, oh yeah, we, yeah. We we were pretty much uh, trying to play from behind the whole time. Mm-hmm. Well, it's kind of like. When the tribes are that small, if you if your tribe gets sent to tribal council, you being the only person that sticks out, it seems obvious they would send you home. Uh, not only was it obvious, uh, uh, which I totally agree, and, and on the case of my tribe, they figured like it, it was something that to be that needed to be taken advantage of. They didn't want to wait until I was out in the open, as Ozzy put it, in uh, in, in a tribal council at this, uh, you know, one of the unaired parts of tribal council. He explained that. Uh, that they were concerned that once uh, I got myself out of the situation, that they would they wouldn't have another chance to get me out. So they felt they had to throw the challenge. They had to do what they did. Otherwise, there'd be no chance later. Well, throwing the challenge always bites people in the books. I mean, the next two people to go were from your tribe, and then Ozzy was the only one that made it far. Uh, I, I completely agree. Uh, I, to me, I, to this day, I still call it a survivor suicide bombing. They pretty much uh, killed themselves to kill to, to kill me, and uh, not having any Hispanics on the uh, on the jury is what caused Ozzy the game. All he needed was just one of us. He needed one more vote. That's all he needed, and uh-huh. he didn't have it because we were all gone. And it seems to me that on uh, I would rewatch the first episode, and you formed an alliance, I think, with JP right away. Yeah, uh, it was me, JP, and Ozzy, and then. Uh, in an unaired part of uh, uh, the the first challenge, Christina set me on fire, and uh, even <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you would think they would show it, but I guess they were kind of worried I'd sue because of the way I reacted. <laughs> I mean, I, I didn't help my cause by going, "I'm suing, I'm suing." <laughs> Wait, yeah, tell us the story. How did you get set on fire? <laughs> All right, um, uh, we had to retrieve uh, a torch. And which was lit on a which was on a platform in the middle of the water, and that torch had a barrel of kerosene next to it. So we would make this puzzle boat, paddle out to it, grab the torch, dip it in the kerosene, and then take it back, uh, light the cauldron on fire at the end of the challenge, and that's how you win the challenge. 
So uh, Christina went to step on the platform in the in the middle of the water, and of course it wasn't stable because it's just floating in the water. So it dipped the barrel of kerosene all over me, and uh, uh, we were in such a hurry to try to win that we thought nothing of it. We kept paddling and uh, whatever. We, uh, we we didn't think anything of it. It just sucked for for that moment. Uh -huh. So fast forward to the towards the end of the challenge, we're climbing up the ladder to get to the top of the platform to light the cauldron. And the rule was that the, the torchbearer had to go last. That was just a rule. Um, I guess that was to ensure that everybody was on the platform before the uh, before the torch uh, the, the cauldron gets lit. So I was the second to the last one up. And uh, uh, while I was climbing, the ladder came apart because it was made of the bolt puzzle pieces. And so uh, uh, as that stopped my forward momentum, Christina kept climbing and she had the torch and she lit me. And I had all that kerosene on me. On me. <laughs> so uh, Jeff Probst, who was at the top of the platform, was no more than 10 feet away from me. No more than 10 feet away from me. And he's just yelling, Billy's on fire. He's engulfed <laughs> in flames. <laughs> and, and I'm staring up at him like, I want, you know, half, part of me is gnashing my teeth because of the pain. And the other part is gnashing my teeth because this asshole is like, just like, 10 feet away from me, and he ain't doing jack shit. You know? Like, put me out, motherfucker. <laughs> well, well, so how badly were you on, were you on, like, how badly were you burned? Um, I had to change shorts, obviously, because <laughs> those <laughs> shorts were no more. Um, uh, and that's a little, little tidbit. If you look at the first episode and second episode, I'm wearing two different sets of shorts. Um, I was burnt enough to where it slowed me down, to where now the whole thing of me working and not working, that's what was really behind it. You were, was, you got burned, and so that caused you to be lazy. Yeah, it wasn't that I was lazy. It was that I, I would go and I would do the work, but it would be like moving in, in slow motion. And uh, every so often when I after I would be done with my, uh, with my chore, I'd have to take a break and you know kind of pull myself together. And so I wasn't able to jump from one chore to the other to the other. It would have to be like a like a half hour break in between, so that that's what that's what made it possible for for Ozzy to pitch. Oh, Billy's lazy. We should throw the challenge. He's a he's a you know he's a hindrance on our tribe. It was just a a selling point to try to get Christina and and Cecilia to go along with it. It wasn't that I was really lazy, which you know it was it was it was that I appeared to be a hindrance and Ozzy just used it. Okay, well let's go back real quick. So. What happened after, you know, you had a, your shorts caught on fire. Then did you have to refilm the challenge? No, no, no. Uh, I got to the top of the platform. I rolled myself out, and the Asian tribe, which had beat, uh, beaten us to be for first place, came over, and they helped put me out. And uh, uh, Christina lit the cauldron, and that was the end of the challenge for us. It was just now a battle between the black team and the white team. So, uh so yeah, that's why I'm not nowhere in the picture when you see the end of that challenge. <laughs> like they were very careful to pick camera angles where you wouldn't see me like rolling on the ground with a bunch of Asian people patting my rear end trying to put me out. I can just I have this picture in my head of like uh, Yule and Cowboy and Becky stomping you out and trying to help you and Ozzy just kind of looking over at you, like, huh? He's on fire. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean. It, it, there's actually a little funny moment where uh, uh, Christina gets gets to the top of the platform and she's staring at me being put out. And as I'm being put out, I look up and I yell, win the challenge! <laughs> so she goes and she likes the cauldron. And uh, Ozzy and, and, and JP are like, yeah, we won. <laughs> and then they kind of they kind of freeze, like freeze frame. And then they kind of look over to see if like I'm like about to jump them and beat the crap out of them. <laughs> Because <laughs> uh, they were the ones that constructed the ladder in the first place. So, <laughs> oh, wow. that's a, that's a great story. Um, so how do you feel about Ozzy personally? You know, Ozzy and I get along, but there's always I think there's always going to be that little underlying tension. We we see each other at a lot of different uh, reality charity events. And, uh, you know, we shake hands, we have drinks together, and I think we get along better after drinks. But, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, I think there's always that underlying tension. Like, he's, he's always going to remember that he screwed me enough that he doesn't want to, like, 
push his luck and say the wrong jokes around me, you know? (laughs) And then at the same time, I'm on the other end to where he screwed me enough to where, yeah, we're friends, but if you screw me again, I'm going to make a cement block out of this guy (laughs) and leave him at the bottom of the nearest large body of of water. So (laughs) it's always that tension, you know? Okay. How do you feel about him getting three chances to play? You know, I, I to, to be honest with you, it was very apparent to me uh, the, the first day that we got out there that this guy had professional training. Like, I'm a former Marine. I know what it's like to be a guy, an average guy that comes off the couch and a guy that's gotten professional training. So mm-hmm. I could tell the difference. And, you know, I, it was just very evident to me, like, uh, okay, this guy got, like, pros to help him and who 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 would hire these pros if it's not survivor so yeah. you know it, at, on one hand i was like well good for him i'm happy he's he's gonna be like the mike portrayed as the michael jordan of survivor and i was right and oh. on the other hand i was like well for the proof that i was screwed to begin with that you know they they picked the pro wrestler because they knew a pro wrestler would would likely keep his mouth shut and just do the job and be happy just be happy and get a paycheck yeah Cool, cool. Well, um, this is something when a lot of people talk about survivors for a second chance season, your name comes up. Would you go back? Yeah, I would go back. Um, I, you know, I think I think the fans would a they would smack the bejesus out of me if I were to turn it down. <laughs> yeah, we want to see you back. <laughs> thank you. I speak for all the super fans. We want to see you back. Oh, thank you, thank you. And uh, I'll be to be honest with you, I, I felt like. I had no chance before my feet ever touched land. My fate was decided. And so, you know, I'd like to play a survivor where I'm on equal footing, where, where it's, you know, it's everybody has an equal shot at, at winning. Oh yeah. I can definitely see that. Uh, I know for, I've read tons of uh, fan fictions where people wish that you come back into survivor and you're a complete challenge beast and you have like no body fat and you're ripped and you win every single immunity challenge. Thank you. Thank you. That's what we want to see. Thank you. Uh, To be honest with you, they didn't edit it this way, but that first challenge, I was a challenge monster. A, I deciphered tree mill, which nobody else in that game and Cook Islands was able to do. I was the only guy to be able to decipher tree mill, and David Burris was the one who told me this after the fact. It's like, you you figured out tree mill both times exactly the way we had planned out the challenge. The only guy to do that. And I think he said the only guy to do that since pre-All-Stars. Um, wow. and, and, uh, at least to that point, the cook Islands, cause he told me this b- backstage, uh, of the finale show. Uh, and then the second thing is I was the guy who came up with the strategy of who did what and putting people in position to, to, to be successful in that first challenge. And I was the guy who put together the first, the, uh, not the first, but put together the puzzle boat. Uh, they showed, they, they showed a bunch of stand-ins putting it together all at the same time, like, all five of us putting it together. But the way it really went down, it was JP tried it for about 10 minutes. And uh, uh, Jeff Probe was like, the I2 tribe was falling out of it. So I was like, all right, you had your shot, JP. Now it's my turn. And in 60 seconds, I put it together. Cool, cool. Um, so, you know, when it comes to puzzles, they didn't show it. Puzzles, riddles, that sort of thing. That's my forte. That's where I would kill. Um Balance because of my pro wrestling. That's another area where I would kill. Mm-hmm. Well, um, this is something I rewatched the first two episodes of Cook Islands today, and I noticed that in the challenge that they threw, if they wouldn't have thrown that challenge, you guys would have easily beaten the uh, Yellow Tribe. You know, to be honest with you, we'd have easily beaten all of the tribes because we sat and read the book, and uh, even though nobody else did, and then we caught up to everybody, and then that's when the throw started to happen. That's when uh. Uh, they wrapped it. We were all chained up and they, one of them wrapped themselves around uh, part of the obstacle to where I couldn't pull everybody. And uh, I pulled people for about 15 minutes and I used up all my energy to try to pull people through the obstacles, but they were, they had wrapped themselves up in that obstacle. So, you know, for me to pull them, I would have had to like break the wood of the obstacle. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's why towards the end, I had like zero energy. It was from 15 minutes of nonstop tug of war. Oh Yeah. Well, it's to me, it's just so disappointing watching a, a tribe throw a challenge like that. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you tune in to see a competition, 
you know, you know, you want to see people win and lose legit. You know, nobody wants to tune in and see see somebody lay down and die. To me, throwing a challenge is as much of sin as somebody quitting. Oh yeah, I, I agree. And what I love is that in Survivor history, every time a challenge is thrown, it has never worked out for those people that threw it. Yeah, because people think because they they watch like Big Brother, and it almost it seems like almost always works out in Big Brother, but it never works out in Survivor. And I say that's because in Big Brother, the only person that that deals with consequences is the person who throws a challenge, whereas in Survivor, the entire tribe deals with the consequences. Mm-hmm. So it's easier to cover one person's ass than it is, let's say, in my case, five people's asses. Oh, yeah. Um, have you been keeping up with current seasons of Survivor? I never miss an episode. You never miss an episode? All right, cool. Let's talk about uh, Survivor Philippines. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Are you enjoying it? Uh, well, first of all, let me just say – I wish to God every episode was 90 minutes. <laughs> yes, I completely agree with you. It makes the show so much better. Yeah, because in the in the one hour format, it's like the aftermath of of of, uh, uh, of tribal council, the challenge, tribal council. That's it. And the end the episode with the 90 minute episode, you get to see all the stuff that happens that that explains why things turn out the way they do. Plus, you get to meet the people. Oh, yeah. Who's your favorite person so far? Well, I'm biased toward Jonathan Penner, so besides him. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, so, uh, do you like Jonathan or do you hate Jonathan? I love Jonathan You Penner. love Jonathan? I loved him back in my season. Mm-hmm. I, honest to God, if I wouldn't have got eliminated uh, when I did, let's be serious. The, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the pick for the Blue Tribe was just nothing but beefcakes because that's just what Brad liked. You know, he's a gay guy. He likes his guys. Nice meeting. So I would have ended up on, on Jonathan's tribe. It would have took Jonathan maybe one sentence to convince me to go with them. Oh, wow. Because <laughs> that's how good he is. But I would have convinced Jonathan, like, to not go with Yule, not go with Becky because they're inseparable. I would have convinced Jonathan to, to take to take Cowboy and take Flicka because they 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 just did his bidding. No questions asked. Mm-hmm. That would have been a completely different game. Completely different game. Plus, you wouldn't have had the uh, hidden immunity idol because we wouldn't have threw the challenge. I was the one who sent Yule to, to Exile Island. Uh-huh. So he wouldn't have had it. It would have been in somebody else's hands, probably Jonathan's. <laughs> <laughs> so I think I think uh, that thrown challenge cost Jonathan the final three. Oh, wow. Cool. Cool. That's good insight. Um, what do you think of uh, Mike Scoopin? Mike Scoopin is the same crazy SOB I've always known him to be. Uh, I've known him outside the game uh, for years, and uh, that dude – and I've wrestled with him, by the way. I, I, I was in a battle royal with Mike Scoopin. And, uh, uh, wait, who – did you win? Uh, no, uh, Maven from Tough Enough won, which was uh, – the, the whole battle royal was nothing but reality stars. And, of course, the reality star that did a TV show of pro wrestling won. That makes so, sense. Yeah. <laughs> So uh, uh, Mike Scoopin is the type of guy that jumps in head first and not worry about the consequences until about one second till impact. <laughs> That's the way he is <laughs> in real life. And so see him play the game that way and then suffer all these injuries. Yeah, that's him. <laughs> <laughs> so while everyone else at home is like, oh, my God, poor guy, poor Mike, you're just like, yeah, that's just what he does. Yeah, that's him. I'm like, uh, to me, I'm thinking to myself, if they're showing all of this, there must have been twice as many injuries. Like they're showing <laughs> us half. <laughs> what about a uh, Russell Swan? Oh man, you know, there's always one guy that gets thrown under the bus in the edit, and this this season so far, one episode in, it's Russell Swan. Because when you say one thing and then they show you doing another thing, you know there's a producer that has it in for you. <laughs> you know, there's one. Yeah. You know, he's he's saying, "Oh, I don't want to be the leader," and then they're showing him be the leader. Of course, you know he got he, he's getting thrown under the bus in the edit. They could have just had him not you know not shown that that clip of him saying he's not going to be a leader, and instead show the clip of people saying you know what we we should let we should let Russell be the leader because he's the experienced one and we'll let him take all the blame. Like that would have been a more standard edit, but when a producer has it in for you, you get the one that Russell's getting. Ooh, well, uh, who's your favorite non-returning player of this season? Um, uh, I think, I think RC is fun in a giddy way. Like she's like, as soon as she got in the island alone with Abby was like, Oh my God, Oh my God. 
And I was like, oh, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> here we go. This is like the uh, like the sorority girls getting together. <laughs> you think she's going to cause some damage? I think she's going to cause chaos. I don't know about damage, but definitely chaos. <laughs> <laughs> Which is a good thing. I like chaos. <laughs> um, I feel terrible, terrible for Felisa, the Facts of Life girl. Mm-hmm. Cause she lost. She she's basically telling us the story how she she blew her money, and so she needs the money, yeah. and she looks like she's gonna go early, which means she won't make as much money. So, you know, I feel terrible. And as for Jeff Kent, I'm a huge baseball fan, but it does not surprise me that the baseball player is the gimpiest guy there. <laughs> <laughs> These guys, man. As much as I love the sport, like. One hangnail and they're on the 15 day disabled list. Like they're, they're so gimpy. <laughs> what about um with Zane? How did you feel about Zane? Oh man, that dude. Well, first of all, like I said, I love chaos, and he was chaos. Mm-hmm. He he did basically what I did when he felt like he had no shot in hell. He gave himself every shot in hell as far as like doing a doing a, a, a an alliance with every person on his tribe. Like, that's basically all you can do is when you think you have no shot in hell is to just basically take shots in the dark and see what sticks. Mm-hmm. And uh, towards the end, I, we, 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 got a, we got to see why I felt he thought he had no shot in hell because he had just quit smoking the day of. So that dude was like fiending for a cigarette his entire time <laughs> on Survivor. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and I think that's what made him crazy. That's what uh, made, gave him all those mood swings where he was on a super high, super low. And and he asked me about it out, and I think that's really what did him in. I think, um, yeah, you know, I think he did something us guys do a lot, like when we're out in a bar and we're rapping to a girl, and then we say something stupid, and then we're like, oh, yeah, we meant to do that. Like, that's uh-huh. what Saint did. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's exactly what he did. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, I'm into sound stupid to you, baby. Yeah, exactly. So he was like, yeah, I, I meant to ask to be voted out. It's just my brilliant strategy. Because <laughs> uh-huh. that's the thing is I don't know how brilliant any strategy can be if it involves people, like, thinking about voting you out. Yeah, yeah. I subscribe to the to the, to the the Sandra Diaz uh, uh, school of, of Survivor, which is – which is point your finger at the person next to you, and if they look at you, just take their face and force them to look at the other person. <laughs> <laughs> well, that is a great strategy. She is uh, the only two-time winner. She did it without without being a hard worker, without being any good at challenges, <laughs> with, with never keeping her mouth shut. She was always <laughs> the loudest person on, on our tribe. Uh, she she basically took the uh, the the... the Survivor textbook and wiped their butt with it and threw it away like, well, and won twice. <laughs> well, it's interesting because you look at challenge dominators like Colby and Ozzy and they haven't won at all. Then there's someone like Sandra who has never won a challenge and she's won it twice. Never won a challenge, never lifted a finger around around a uh, camp. And, uh, and, and she had no problem getting in everybody's face. <laughs> so, I mean, what... what all this idea of like, if you keep your mouth shut, you'll make it to the end. Or if you work hard, you'll make it to the end. Or if you kick ass in challenges, nobody can beat you. I mean, all these schools of thoughts, uh, she she just proves them all wrong. And that's what I love about her. Oh, yeah. I completely agree. I think she's an amazing player. I'm going to name off a couple other survivors, and I want you to tell me how you feel about them, okay? All right. Richard Hatch. <laughs> He's been bamboozled. <laughs> That's my all-time favorite line on Survivor. I've been bamboozled. <laughs> you know, he's a quote machine. I'll tell you that. Um, he played in an era where it was character-driven. It wasn't game-driven. He just had to play enough. That's all to, to, to win. In fact, uh, you had an entire tribe not really playing thinking that, oh, it's, it's a terrible thing to gang up on someone. And you had another guy with the alphabetical voting strategy, which to this day, I swear, is the all-time worst strategy. <laughs> Nobody can change my mind. <laughs> so, okay, you know, Rich was the original guy. He, he kind of wrote the, the book on how to play Survivor, but in his era, it was character-driven, and he was probably one of the greatest characters. Cool, cool. Do you want to see him back again? Sure, yeah. I guess I would like to see a lot of characters back. I get bored when there's nothing but but 
people flying under the radar left in the game. Like mm-hmm. that puts me to sleep. <laughs> I end up having to watch the episode like with the pause button so that I can, you know, wake myself up, <laughs> <laughs> get back to watching. <laughs> um, what about Russell Hans? Russell Hans. Russell Hans is what you get when you get Johnny Fairplay on steroids. <laughs> 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 um, it doesn't surprise me that those two guys will probably would never get along in a game. Uh, <laughs> they're too much alike. Um, but yeah, Russell Hands. I like the way I like the way he drives the season. Like he makes sure something happens in the season. There, you, you're not going to get a boring season with him around. You may not like what's happening, but you're 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 into what's happening. You're watching it. Um, for him as a person, I met him outside the game. He's actually all right. He's a, he's a cool guy. He's down to earth most of the time. Most of the time? <laughs> do you have a do you have a funny Russell Hand story? Uh yeah, actually uh uh Russell Russell myself and Sandra went to this uh to this reality uh reality charity event uh, in Orlando where uh it was in a water park and uh the uh, the water park wanted to take uh, uh footage of Russell Hands by the shark tank because, you know, he was a shark in the game. Mm-hmm. And while I'm sitting next to Sandra waiting for this to be over, because this is only for Russell and nobody else, none of the rest of us get to take a picture with the sharks. <laughs> uh, Sandra is like, she's like trying to trying to convince herself, like, sit down, don't do it. Whatever you do, don't push Russell into the tank. Don't do it. <laughs> I'm, like, I'm like, Sandra, what are you talking about? She's like, it, it, she tells me, I want to push Russell into the tank. I want to see if those chunks will be like trying to eat him or they'll be like, oh, he's terrible. I don't want to eat <laughs> nothing that tastes that bad. <laughs> I'm like, you're evil, Sandra. <laughs> Love you. <laughs> okay. Um, what about poverty? Poverty is a chameleon. In the first game, she was a seductress. In the second game, she was a manipulator. In her third game, she was a challenge monster. She's a chameleon. You never know what kind of game she's going to play. She's probably the best chameleon to ever play. And uh, as a person, uh, she's she's very much a sorority, happy-go-lucky girl. Mm-hmm. Do you have any funny poverty stories? Uh, I don't know if it's funny, but we were, uh, we were uh, partying, like a pre-party to the 10-year anniversary thing. And... Uh, it was me and Earl and, and Poverty and a group of other survivors. And we couldn't hear it really well because of the music uh, that was blasting. And so Poverty said something about hanging on to Earl. Um, and me and Earl looked at each other. And somewhere in while we're looking at each other, we hear something about being wrapped around Earl's neck like like a mink stole. And I look at Earl and I'm like, damn, dude, not only are you like the the only unanimous winner up to that point, the only unanimous winner ever, but like now you got women wanting to be your mixed doll. And I just grabbed poverty and I just put her in in in, in Earl's arms, like, here you go. <laughs> and poverty just looked at me like she's gonna kill me. <laughs> so I suddenly mingled. <laughs> All right. How about Candace? Candace, Candace, you know, I, I haven't stopped apologizing enough to poor Candace because I, I totally like like grabbed her and threw her into the through the middle of my craziness. Uh, it's a it's the middle of my storyline without like her even knowing anything about it. So I've been apologizing to her like crazy, um, even though I'll admit that when she was on Heroes versus Villains, I was rooting for her because nobody would remember her if not for me. So I felt like if she won, she'd owe me ten percent. That's so. a good assessment. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you. So I was rooting for her. I wanted ten percent. That's a hundred grand. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think the whole Candace thing is um, pretty – I mean, it's just funny to look at it, back at it in retrospect, you know. It was just a nice little moment of the season, kind of. It gave life to the pregame – or to the pre-merge of your season. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I, I You know, I tell a lot of people, like, you put a bunch of white people on, a, on, a, on an island with other white people, that's Survivor. You take Hispanic people and put them on an island with other Hispanic people, that's deportation. <laughs> <laughs> Every Hispanic knows the best way to become American is to marry a white woman. And Candace was a white woman. <laughs> and you were like, you saw her and you're like, I'm marrying you. Damn it. Yeah, I'm like, I want to be American again. I 
So, uh, hey, that's so that's why I, why I feel like I didn't lose. I was like, here I am. I'm in America again. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Who is your uh, most favorite winner of all time? Most favorite winner of all time. That's a toughie. Uh, you know, I'm gonna go with uh, with uh, Bob Crowley. Really? Go, yeah, yeah, Bob Crowley, because uh, he's a he's the oldest guy to ever win. So, and you know how it is on Survivor when you're the oldest person there, you're the most likeliest to go first. Mm-hmm. Doesn't always work out that way, but most often, more often than not, especially somebody of his age. So to be the guy who's most likely to go out first to finish, you know, to finish as the winner, that's a feat in itself. And then he did it with his brain. He did it. He did it with intelligence. He did it with with being a good person. And uh, you know, he's uh, and he and I uh, were part of a fraternity. It's the same fraternity. So you know, he's my he's my brother in my fraternity. So I gotta I gotta mention him anyways. Okay. <laughs> um, what's your favorite season of all time? Ah, okay. Um. Uh, favorite season. You know, I, I guess I would have to go with Pearl Island. Yeah, Pearl Islands. Pearl Islands, they um they threw the challenge in Pearl Islands, but then they brought them back. And that to me is like what you what survivors should always do when a throne challenge happens. When a throne challenge happens, just bring everybody back and give 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 all the early boots a shot to to make the to make their way back into the game and uh Somebody, you know, somebody that that got uh, got eliminated via the throne challenges on that tribe, they're gonna feel satisfied. Like at least they had a chance to fight their way back. Oh yeah, I see what you're saying. I see exactly what you're saying. Uh, what's your favorite survivor challenge? Uh, favorite survivor challenge. Hmm. Good question. Good question. Um, you know, this is probably personal bias. Um. But my uh, my favorite challenge happened in Cook Islands. I didn't get to, to participate in it, but uh, it was fun nonetheless. And it was the wrestling challenge where they would wrap themselves on a pole, and you'd have two people try to drag uh, drag them off the pole and across the line. You and, were uh, so good in that challenge. Oh, you know, mm-hmm. I, I'd have, I'd have totally like put like like a figure four leg lock on somebody. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, yeah, I, I to me, in my opinion, that challenge was created with the belief that I would have been there to be in it. Mm-hmm. They wanted to give you a chance to, you know, show how kick-ass you are. Yeah, to, you know, use my skills, the skills that I have that above everybody else, which is wrestling. Yeah. Um, but oh well, I didn't get to participate in it. But I still, I still consider it my favorite challenge ever. And if you think about it, that's a challenge that anybody can play in their backyard. <laughs> <laughs> We can do that. We can set up like a backyard survivor thing. Oh, totally! Like I, I've I've done that twice actually as a as a as a host. Uh, I had some fans contact me and uh, they uh, they took care of me. They paid my way, threw some money my way, and uh, we played backyard survivor. And uh, I was the host. And at the end of it, you know, we did like a one day version of it or six hour version of it. And and at the end of it, we had a barbecue and 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 hung out. That sounds really fun. Um, yes. So if you got fans and stuff you know just put it together and then take care of me and i'll go there and i'll <laughs> you'll have a real survivor in your backyard yeah. survivor game <laughs> well my backyard's really small we'll have to talk to dennis dennis what's your backyard like it's not that very big either all right we'll find one we're gonna find a backyard okay billy <laughs> all right you know you could just do it like at a, at a lake or whatever at some some uh some park or whatever I oh. think one of the games I played was at Central Park. It was Backyard Survivor, but it was Central Park. <laughs> <laughs> when you guys do challenges, how long do they run in real life? Uh, depending on the challenge, uh, but a lot of them, all of them run longer than what you see on TV. Um, the uh, the first challenge uh, on Cook Islands, I would say, ran about just shy of, of an hour. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and then the second challenge was about... I don't know. I'd say about forty minutes. Cool, cool. Well, so they're long. <laughs> sounds like it. What did you think of One World? One World. Well, Leaf is one of my all-time favorite characters. So just just because of him, I liked it. But uh, uh, we would see the the men versus women so many times before that. You know, okay, they, they try to put a little spin on it by having them both on the same beach. Mm-hmm. Um, 
I don't know. I, I just felt like this versus stuff is it's gotten kind of stale. Like that was that that might have been the jump in the shark on the versus concept in, in, in Survivor. Like like what else are they gonna do? Like blondes versus brunettes? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> it's it's, well, it's, uh, getting, it's getting to the end of that, or I think it's the end of the versus. Idea. They should do uh, people that got voted out second versus um, <laughs> I don't know models or something. <laughs> Well, what I would like to see is like a pre-jury versus a post-jury. If you're going to do versus, uh-huh. like that would be a nice in-house one. Or a uh, a Survivor versus Big Brother versus Amazing Race and have the three-tribe format that we're seeing now. Uh-huh. That would be really cool. Yeah, yeah. And then to make it fair for the Big Brothers and the Amazing Race, you would have nothing but early boots because otherwise he – Yeah, you know, otherwise it's not fair. It would be like Billy. It would be you. Chicken, James, um, Carolina from Token Machines. Nice. <laughs> Let's you call Mark Burnett. Let's get this going right now. Yeah, yeah. See, you had to put a good-looking woman on her tribe. Otherwise, I'd be upset. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the standard in Survivor now. You have, like, the one random hot chick, like Angie in Philippines. Yeah. <laughs> Even yeah. though I am so glad she has a personality. Because if not, it would have made made me liking her really weird. Yeah, yeah, you know, um, every so often you'll get a season where it's nothing but hot chicks, and then it's like there's no strategy. So I understand why they they don't put too many hot chicks because mm-hmm. uh, their their whole strategy is to bat their eyes and we'll go their fannies. So uh, <laughs> well, I mean, you have a Redemption Island season where Rob just plowed through all of them. You know? Yeah, oh, and, and there were a lot of hot chicks on, on that season. I'll, I'll agree with you on that. Um, uh, and, of course, Rob, you know, putting putting a four-time player, you know, next to a, a 19-year-old was so not, not fair. <laughs> like, and she's not even – no offense to Natalie. She seems nice, but she's not even the most, you know, headstrong 19-year-old. She was just, you know, a normal 19-year-old. Yeah, well, you know, she was honest with herself. Uh, she, she basically told Rob, like, I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know anything. And Rob was like, light bulb. <laughs> <laughs> you know? I was like, I have an idea, okay? Come yeah, I ha- you remember me and Amber? No, well, uh, d- don't worry. <laughs> she was nine when it was him, her, and Amber. Nine exactly. or eight years old. Because <laughs> that's how um, – I'm a little older than her, and that's how old I was. I was like 10 for that. <laughs> I mean, but don't get me wrong. To have to have fifteen episodes of Natalie Tenerelli was all right by me. I was okay with it, <laughs> but uh, but yeah, it's like you said. Uh, uh, you know, if it wasn't for the Redemption Island aspect of it, we probably wouldn't have seen a whole lot happen that season. Oh yeah, and the Redemption Island turned out to be useless in the end because both people just got voted out right back when they came back on. Yeah, yeah, over and over again, if I remember. <laughs> oh, you had Isaac getting voted out twice in one season. Or three times in one season. That's a record, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, the Redemption Island, uh, what I like about it is that certain people that you would have never known were, like, challenge monsters. Like, I think Dawn was one of them. Like, you'd have never known. They, you, at least we got to see them do their stuff. Uh-huh. And, uh, and she proves that the challenge monsters don't necessarily have to be, like, people like Terry Deeds and Ozzy and, Don, and Kobe Donaldson. People who are like, you know, very athletic. Like she was a, a challenge monster without she was like a mother. She's a mother out there. Same thing with Jane. Jane was like a, a regular person you would look at, and she was a challenge monster. Mm-hmm. In fact, Jane was an older woman, if you think about it. And she was yeah, a challenge. She did really well in those challenges. Yeah, she owned it. Hey Billy, uh, can you do any celebrity impersonations? <laughs> Yesterday, James Miller did one of the best John Wayne's I've ever heard. Sean Wayne. All right. Well, uh, being a pro wrestler, may this one rest in peace. Oh, yeah. It's the macho man, Randy Savage. Uh-huh. And I'm going down that aisle. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't Dennis, know if that was any good. but <laughs> That was pretty good. Dennis texted me, and he said he approves. So Okay. <laughs> Dennis approves, so it's good. All right. <laughs> well, Billy, thank you so much for coming on. It means so much to us. Is there anything else you would like to say? Uh, wow, yeah. Uh, please continue to support the uh, Survivor 
and uh, all the reality events that we put on. Uh, our next one is in October uh, 11th to the 14th in Virginia. So visit realityrescue1.com, one being the number one. And uh, we're also be, we'll be heading to Temecula next April and uh, Orlando. So check out those as well, uh, realityrally.com and hearts, heartsofreality.com. So, uh, yeah, keep supporting. Come out and meet us. Find out all the real stuff that happened behind the scenes. And, uh, and, and it's as cool for us to meet the fans as it is for the fans to meet us. I'm a fan of the fans. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you again so much, Billy. And thank you, listeners. All right, thank you for having me on. And keep on rocking. Yeah.